2021 was a decent enough year for games. Metroid Dread was really cool, and proved that side-scrollers and Metroidvanias absolutely deserve the big budgets that AAA studios seemingly refused to give them. Resident Evil 8 was a lot of fun, and effortlessly combined the wackiness and the horror that the series' best entries are known for. Unsighted, Death Store, Chicory, and Inscription were all really excellent and unique indie titles. There were some absolutely phenomenal Lisa games, if you're one of the eight people in the world who cares about that. But just at the very end of the year, on December 17th, a little $15 indie game slid its way onto Steam and has easily become my favorite game released that year. Hell, it might be my favorite game of this year so far, too. And that game is called Brutal Orchestra. Now, even if you're pretty tapped into the indie game scene, you probably haven't heard of this game. It currently sits at less than 300 reviews on Steam, and while that is absolutely criminal given the game's level of quality, I can't blame you for not having heard of it before. So then, what kind of game even is it? What's it even about? And why, of all games, is it absolutely worth your time? In Brutal Orchestra, you take control of Noak a recently deceased person who has wound up in purgatory. There, he makes a deal with an entity known as Bosch, in order to track down and get revenge on whoever or whatever killed him in the first place. This involves navigating the shores and terrain of purgatory, recruiting the souls of others still trapped there, and fighting against the horrific creatures that reside in this version of the afterlife. Visually, Brutal Orchestra takes direct, clear inspiration from the works of 15th century painter Hieronymus Bosch, mostly in its area and enemy designs, and as you progress further into the game, those visuals become increasingly surreal. This game's atmosphere is incredibly thick, and the writing is succinct and yet full of personality. I'm not going to get too in-depth on the story here, both because I want to keep this video fairly spoiler-free for those who want to experience it for themselves, but also because I think this game does truly shine through its gameplay. In general, this video is going to be more of a review and recommendation than a full-on analysis, partially because I want you guys to go out and experience it for yourself. Brutal Orchestra is a turn-based, pixel art roguelike, and while I am well aware that there are literally dozens of other indie games out there that match that exact description, what sets Brutal Orchestra apart is the sheer complexity and intricacy in every aspect of its game design. And that complexity is effortlessly established on both the side of the player and the side of the enemies, making every interaction a tense set of tactical decisions that stretch your resources and urge you to use your limited moveset in constantly creative ways. Every choice you make, both inside of combat and out, has a direct mechanical impact on your success in a way that you immediately feel and understand. Combat is quick and reliable, but also offers dozens of tactical options for how you want to approach each encounter, especially if you want to try to escape without taking any damage. Enemies are ruthless and have moves explicitly designed to put you outside your comfort zone, but their intentions and capabilities are always clearly telegraphed to the player. As such, combat is hard, but it's always fair, which is something most other turn-based games and even most other roguelikes just can't always say. With truly excellent combat, gigantic build variety, incredible music, unique and well-designed bosses, and a constantly engaging presentation, everything in Brutal Orchestra ties together to create one of the best game experiences I've had in years. So if you've known me for any amount of time, you know that I am a huge fan of a good turn-based combat system. While I can love a constantly engaging, real-time system with a lot of options, something about the strategy provided by turn-based systems always keeps calling me back. Whether it's the status effects-heavy combat found in the Lisa series, 
the active time rolling health system of Mother 3 and Earthbound, the emotion system of Omori, or the hybrid of traditional RPG and bullet hell found in Toby Fox's games, I've always enjoyed the strategy and planning that is allowed from turn-based combat. So, I do not mean this next sentence lightly when I say that Brutal Orchestra has the single greatest turn-based combat system that I have ever seen in a video game. Turn-based systems, as a general rule, thrive on giving the player lots of options for what to do with a character, as well as making every move and every attack feel strategic and purposeful. A lot of RPGs can allow the player to simply fall into the pattern of just spamming attacks and healing when you need to, but Brutal Orchestra never allows for this kind of one-dimensional play. Every turn, you need to strategically utilize your one movement and one attack per character in your party in order to mitigate damage while also maximizing the amount you can do. Brutal Orchestra's battlefield is divided into five even lanes, and constantly moving between them is essential to playing well. And this goes above and beyond simply trading damage or using high damage attacks with little regard for everything else. And Brutal Orchestra forces you to pay extremely close attention to all of its mechanics in order to truly understand its combat. And this is all due to the game's absolutely genius central gimmick. The Pigment System. In order for party members to perform attacks or abilities, they need to use pigment. Pigment comes in four distinct colors red, blue, yellow, and purple, and is dropped by enemies upon hitting them. Every enemy's health bar is a specific color, and that color directly corresponds to the pigment they drop upon being damaged. You and your party members also have different colored health bars, and will drop pigment yourselves upon being damaged as well. And on top of all this, the one party member that you will always have reliable access to, Nowak, uses a replenishing yellow pigment generator, meaning that at least he will always be able to attack and generate pigment for the other party members, turning him into a resource-generating center point to the rest of your team. It's an extremely dynamic resource system, allowing for total control over what kind of mana you have access to and how you use it, with different party members using different colors for their abilities and forcing you to on-the-fly adapt to their diverse playstyles. The thing that elevates the system from a neat gimmick into one of the contenders for the Game Mechanic Hall of Fame, however, is the way it can work against you through pigment overflow. Your pigment bar can only hold up to 10 pigment at a time, and any more that you acquire will fall into overflow. At the end of the turn, if you haven't spent everything in your overflow, it will clear and your party will take damage based on how much extra you have. This geniusly turns every single attack and move you make into a genuinely nail-biting decision, as you have to balance attacking enemies and using abilities with just keeping everyone alive. You're never allowed to just turn your brain off and spam your most destructive moves, as doing so can result in insane amounts of overflow. Strategic thinking then becomes a must if you want to do fights without taking damage, which is important since the blue pigment which usually allows characters to heal can be very difficult to come by. The combat system also does its very best to make sure that every time you take damage or lose a party member, it was entirely because of a clear mistake you personally made. At the top of the screen, the game clearly lists what action each enemy is going to take this turn, and even which order they're going to take them in, with mostly zero randomization in how those moves are going to play out, and making it abundantly clear if there is any. This communicates where the enemy is going to attack, roughly how much damage they're going to deal, how to avoid it, and even where they're going to end up. Being given this much information seems like it would make the game extremely easy, but the movesets on the enemies are creative and punishing enough that, even knowing what they're going to do, it can often be very difficult or require creative thinking to avoid damage. It's the sign of well-constructed difficulty if a game can be entirely honest to you about everything that's going to happen and yet still somehow remain challenging, and that is something that Brutal Orchestra's combat excels at. Turn-based combat often gets a bad reputation for being boring, uninteractive, or lacking meaningful input from the player, but the amount of interplaying mechanics in Brutal Orchestra and the intricacies in how they tie together creates by far one of the most engaging combat systems I have ever seen in any game I've played. Something that helps massively in making Brutal Orchestra's combat fun and engaging across many runs is the gigantic variety of party members that you can recruit to your team. 
Outside of Nowak, who you always start runs with and acts as sort of a centerpiece to your group's abilities, there are 22 different party members, all with extremely diverse and very creative movesets and abilities. You start each run with two additional characters, usually one offensive and one defensive, and you can recruit others by finding them on the map or by hiring them with currency. While each of them only has about three moves that they can use, all of them feel functionally distinct from each other. A run where you start with, say, Burnout and Hans inherently plays different from a run where you have Fennec and Griffin. A team with lots of damage dealers who utilize red pigment requires you to play extremely aggressively, focusing on one single target as hard as you can while utilizing clever positioning to stay out of harm's way. Any team that features characters that utilize purple pigment, however, often relies on self-damage and more risk-reward gameplay in order to deliver devastating attacks and unique utility options. Even character roles as simple as the healer have a massive amount of variety to them, with Hans playing the closest to a generic medic character, but also having the ability to apply the frail debuff which can lead to enemies taking double damage, often making him the centerpiece of an aggressive playstyle. Fipe, on the other hand, offers the single highest amount of per-target healing, but has a degree of randomness to how he heals that will absolutely blow up in your face at the worst possible time. Think of it kind of like the Vestal and the Occultist from Darkest Dungeon, but with an even higher degree of versatility between the two. And the rest of the party follows suit, offering unique takes on character roles unlike anything else I've seen in a turn-based game. Aegon has an insanely high amount of health, but his inability to be healed even between battles makes using him at all a very risky strategy. Burnout is an absolute powerhouse at the start of combat, but his damage drops off substantially as the fight goes on until he turns into a bit of a liability. Cleaver's moveset revolves almost entirely around self-damage in order to inflict absurd amounts of pain on enemies, while Clive is an excellent tank who can lock enemies down and shrug off status effects like they were nothing. Several of the more unique party members even fill roles that I've never seen in any game before, like Gospel, who is an inanimate statue whose playstyle revolves entirely around directing damage back to himself and allowing his teammates to act multiple times in a round. Bimini, on the other hand, is the exact opposite, as she only has one health and deals very high damage, but redistributes all damage she would take to the rest of the party until she's the last one left. More so than any other roguelike I've ever played, runs feel inherently different based on who you get and how you play. In plenty of roguelikes, the individual runs can sort of start to blend together after you've played them for long enough. And this is, innately, a problem for a genre that requires replayability as much as roguelikes do. So either from a lack of encounter, boss, or item variety, Everything can feel mostly samey, with only a few randomly generated embellishments adding on to the flavor. The over-reliance on that random generation can also sometimes feel like a detriment in the long run, with the player never really feeling like they have any control over the outcome of their runs, and their success is mostly decided by whether or not a dice roll decided to give them the good items. And once again, Brutal Orchestra somehow falls into none of these traps. The game is absolutely 100% beatable without any items and just the party members you start with if you play extremely smart, meaning the game is rarely able to screw you over entirely through randomization. I have had runs where I have felt like the unluckiest man of all time with item drops, but entirely through my own knowledge of the game and its mechanics, I've been able to pull through. And the items that you can acquire are rarely things like straight stat boosts or boring number changes. The majority of them fundamentally alter how a specific party member behaves, like the series of items that replace a character's one damage slap skill with a variety of useful and interesting moves that often have both positive and negative effects. In fact, the majority of the better items come with an interesting downside to offset their power, leading to runs that rely heavily upon risk and reward. One of my favorite items in the game, Lust Pudding, applies the powerful Scar status effect to enemies every turn, but also to your allies, giving you the ability to deal insane amounts of damage, but also take insane amounts of damage in return. Due to these items that fundamentally alter the gameplay loop and the way you engage with the game, runs feel even more distinct from each other. I have almost 100 hours in this game, but I can still vividly recall distinct runs with a combination of party members and items that I received, completely transformed the game's playstyle into something that barely resembles the base gameplay. 
combinations of abilities and items can also spiral wildly out of control. And like all good roguelikes, this game isn't afraid to have a few broken combos in there that can make runs very fun and very funny. The in-game economy is also handled in a very interesting way, as all things that you could possibly want to make your team more effective revolve around the same kind of currency. Powering up your character so that they have higher health and can deal more damage also depletes the same resource that you may want to use in order to buy items or hire new characters for the group. This means that, essentially, money and experience points are the same thing. No part of your subtly increasing power during your run is done in a vacuum, and can turn something as seemingly obvious as leveling up your party into a complicated decision with lots of trade-offs. The game's boss fights are also an extreme high point, a very important note in a genre that requires you to refight bosses so many times. There are 10 total boss fights in this game, and each of them utilizes entirely unique mechanics that requires the player to learn their specific tactics and treat them entirely differently from how they treat other enemies. If you try to approach every boss in the same way with the same strategy, you are going to lose. The threat of Trigger Fingers' instant kill attack always looms large over his encounter and requires a more defensive playstyle, while the ability to skip parts of Roids' turn if you damage him enough encourages you to stay as offensive as you possibly can. The Area 2 bosses specifically all have extremely unique mechanics that are quite unlike anything I've seen in a boss fight before. Ouroboros is an incredibly tense fight, as its body and tail constantly try to drag you towards its mouth, where it can sometimes use an attack that kills party members instantly, but leaves it open to double damage if that attack misses. Smooth Skin, on the other hand, is much more of a puzzle fight, spawning in statues every turn that completely control the battlefield and can apply extremely dangerous status effects to your party members. These statues then die and are replaced two turns later, leading to a fight that is constantly evolving. However, Charcarian is easily my favorite non-final boss, acting as a brutal endurance test that teaches you to master spatial control or die trying. Any boss that can make me scared of a moveset that references the cha-cha slide is clearly onto something. I also, just real quick, want to kind of gush about how much I love the two final bosses. However, that is full of spoilers. If you want to go into this game mostly unspoiled, which I highly recommend, please skip this segment and come back after you've beaten it. You can go to this time code here to continue the spoiler-free review. Alright, so the two final bosses are Heaven and Osman Cynics, who may just be some of my favorite boss fights in any video game. Both require complete mastery of entirely different skill sets, and are so thematically appropriate in how they behave. Heaven is a fight entirely about making sacrifices, fitting as you're going up against a god, and fully expect you to go in with a full party of five. Every other turn, it asks you to offer up one of your characters in the center position, or risk taking damage to everyone else. So you are constantly forced to make difficult decisions on who is worth keeping alive, and who is worth impairing or sacrificing altogether. It also serves as the final challenge for pigment management, as Heaven itself drops zero pigment upon being damaged, but the hands that it can summon do, resulting in choosing when to attack the hands in order to get the fuel to attack the main body with. Every time you attack with someone in this fight, or even just move them to a new position, it feels like the most important decision of the entire run. Osman, on the other hand, tests almost the complete opposite skill set, forcing you to respect his moves and testing your ability to mitigate damage when given an opponent's complex moveset. Osman performs six attacks that also move him every turn, before ending each round by instantly killing the opponent directly across from him. The game gives you all the information about where he's going to attack and where he's going to move, and the challenge is keeping that all in your head and using it strategically. And of course, this isn't even taking into account his phase 2, where he splits down the middle and suddenly you have 12 moves to worry about. When you first fight him, you may think that Mortal Horizon, his instant kill, is his most dangerous move, but on subsequent attempts you realize that concentration is far more dangerous, as, Despite doing zero damage, it moves him in either direction, and is the only move you cannot fully predict. These two fights act as such perfect culminations to the game's mechanics and strategy, and are fantastically designed ways to close out a run. No 
I also think it would do this game a massive disservice to discuss it without drawing attention to the incredible soundtrack. For a game with the word orchestra in its title, it absolutely delivers with dozens of excellent songs that all feel distinct and have never gotten boring across my hundred hours of playtime. Brutal Orchestra sports an absurd amount of quality tracks, with every single enemy encounter having its own unique theme. This does wonders at making each enemy stand out in the player's mind as its own entity, but also ensures that they won't just get stuck listening to the same three songs on repeat throughout many runs. The songs themselves are also incredibly varied, with no two sounding exactly alike and often experimenting in different genres altogether. Despite appearing in the same area, the heavy guitar and drums on Skinning Homunculus' theme sound almost nothing like the orchestral ritual chanting found in Zeitgeists. <laughs> This game also does something that I am personally an absolute sucker for, by having the music directly respond to the gameplay. Songs often have two different versions that are swapped between when certain conditions are met, such as Revola standing up on its hind legs, Charcarian being knocked down, and, my personal favorite, each separate mutation of the Music Men adding a new instrument to their normal theme, eventually transforming it into a full band performance if enough of them are allowed to change form. The music in many roguelikes can often just become background noise after even a few runs, and often with this genre I find myself turning off the music altogether and just playing my own songs or listening to something. However, I've never done this with Brutal Orchestra. The responsiveness of the music to gameplay and the sheer variety of songs makes listening to the game an absolute treat even after all these hours. Like almost every aspect of this game, it encourages replayability for you to come back and try new things, and just keep enjoying it long after you've beaten it. It's a game that fully understands what makes this genre good, and capitalizes on every little thing that makes replaying fun. The term underrated indie gem gets thrown around a lot these days, often at games that I don't really think fit that description much at all. If a game is able to find its audience and develop a dedicated fan following, I'm not sure how much it classifies as still being underrated. However, I would absolutely say that Brutal Orchestra is a game to which that moniker applies. It does some things better than I have ever seen any other video game do, and it is easily one of the best of its genre, which is why it breaks my heart a little to see that it hasn't fully gotten the recognition that I think it deserves. This truly is an indie gem, and I think that with enough exposure, it could easily stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with classics of the genre like Slay the Spire, which, while I still adore for its excellent build variety and unique runs, lacks the visual and auditory presentation and party member diversity that makes Brutal Orchestra so engaging. If you're a fan of this genre, turn-based combat, or even just well-designed games in general, I strongly recommend checking this out. The game is well worth your time, and as I've gotten almost 100 hours out of an asking price of only 15 bucks, this is well worth your money as well. Indie roguelikes is a genre that has been done to death, and I can sometimes feel like it's been refined to its limit. Games like Hades, Enter the Gungeon, Binding of Isaac, Slay the Spire, and Risk of Rain 2 all feel like natural pinnacles of their breed of roguelike, but I firmly believe that Brutal Orchestra joins that category. There are so many more things that I could say about this game. I could talk about some of the unique enemies and how they radically alter combat. I could talk about the absolutely fantastic secret final boss. I could talk about the way the story expertly approaches themes of creativity and the way art impacts us. And I could even talk about the one or two scenes in that story that really did get to me emotionally. But I think I'm gonna leave things here. 
I want all of you to go out and experience one of the most well-designed and creative games of the last few years. And as such, I want to leave a few surprises to you. I desperately hope that this game is able to find a larger audience as it continues to evolve. But as of now, it truly is a criminally underrated masterpiece.